Welcome to A Pint with Shoney B coming to you from Brixton in London. A uh, very cool recording studio called The Dairy. I'm here with a guy called Chris Zane who is a music producer who's worked with uh, a lot of big names, Passion Pit, St. Lucia, Holy Ghost, Friendly Fires and Harlem Shakes. He is one of the biggest record producers we've had on the show, music producers, and I don't know an awful lot about it as I'm sure a lot of my listeners don't. So we're not going to be talking a lot of the kind of amps and fenders and all the stuff that he tends to talk about, more about his life and what he thinks and what he's learned along the way. I'm welcoming Chris Zane. How are you, sir? I'm good. How are you? I'm not too bad. Thank you for taking time to see me. Of course. What are you working on at the moment? Um, Every time somebody asks me that question, my mind just goes, right. oosh. Music. Um, <laughs> Something to do with music. Yeah, I'm just like a million things at once. It's just kind of a revolving door. Right. Every other day, it's a new person. We were just talking about uh, how we both, I lived in New York and Chris is from New York and how we're kind of done with America. Why are you done with America? Well, first I was done with New York because the music scene is just like done. Yeah. And I would, I tell people. Is that people, just gentrification skill? Yeah, yeah. It's like the things that people complain about in London. 15 years in, in the future. Yeah. So you think the new build tower flats are annoying? Go to New York where yeah. they're like 15 years ahead. Oh, you think the real estate's too expensive? Go to New York yeah. where it's been like that already for 20 years. New York's always been a difficult place to live in, yes. but it was balanced out with the cool shit. Now the cool shit's gone mm -hmm. and just all the bad stuff's left, the expensive, crowded yeah. stuff. Yeah. And I would rather move in with my parents than move to L.A., <laughs> so, um, London it was. Why do you hate LA so much? <sighs> well, first of all, it's not a city. It's just Sprawl. a big collection yeah. of people driving around, yeah. which is weird. And yeah, I just, I get it. It's nice. Right. It. No one's arguing. No one's ever argued that the weather is not, not nice. Wheatgrass. We get that. But uh, the people just kind of suck a little bit. Yeah. Now, it's a little better because everyone from New York has moved there, so it feels a little more real. But yeah, I don't know. It's just... It's just not great. You're from New York. What part? Yeah. So I grew up just a few hours north of New York City, and then I moved there towards the end of high school, and I've just lived... I kind of lived half my time in Manhattan, half my time in Brooklyn. So what part? What part of Manhattan were you? It's mostly in the East Village for the most okay. of my tenure, and then I lived in Tribeca at the end. What was your what was you like growing up there? What you know, school and all that. Were you bright or was it music? Uh, I was not bright particularly, and I was always doing music and knew I was going to do music. And really, I feel like I kind of had teachers that were like, "Oh, it's okay. You don't have to try that hard. You're going to be, be a musician." Really, <laughs> kind of, yeah. So, when was the first instrument you played in? Drums. So I'm a right. drummer. So were you that kid who said, can you bring me drums for Christmas and I'm going to no, tear down No, I, house? my brother had drums, played okay. drums, my older brother. And when he and my parents would leave the house and I would be home alone, I would sneak in the basement, which I wasn't allowed to do, and play his drums. And one day they all went to the movies and they forgot something and they came back and they caught me. And did they go, it was wow, good. Sound. You know, like I was better than my older really? brother who was studying and so he threw a strop and was like, I'm done. I'm not playing drums anymore. And I just, that was it. I started playing drums in fourth grade. And then I was just kind of like freakishly good at it with zero training. And by the time I got to about grade seven, grade eight, they were like, maybe you should like start studying because you seem very good at this. And yeah, that was that So was you, went, you went straight into music school as a drummer? Yeah, all the way up into university and then... Got there were you in like, bands when you were a kid? Or when... Yeah, <laughs> like crappy, like high school cover bands. Yeah. But I was like official, orchestra, jazz band, choir, the whole nerdy, disgusting, every <laughs> terrible thing that you're envisioning, marching band. Yeah. I did it all. And, and then I got to university and was like, this sucks, and quit. My parents were like, well, you know what else sucks? Not going to college, so have fun, get a job. So I washed dishes six days a week Where? in a restaurant, it just in a bar. It was right. terrible. And after about a year, I was like, okay, that sucked. Maybe I should go back to school. And they're like, what do you want to go to school for? And I just had no idea. So I just literally, I'm 21 years old at this point, right. picked recording out of like a book. I didn't yeah. know anything about it. I'd never even touched a microphone in my life. Was there a point where you said, I'm not going to become the next insert famous drummer that you like here that you respect? Who is your favorite drummer? I don't think I have one. If you had to pick, like, 
Collins or yeah. no, there's a kid in America named Aaron Spears that I really like a lot. Who's right. like your typical super busy overplaying gospel drummer, but right. he's really good. Yeah, was there a I moment just, when you said I'm not going to be? I don't remember. No, so I was 20 years old. Right. Okay. okay. I don't think I thought about anything then. But like a lot of people that I talk to who want to be footballers or musicians yeah. or famous, they go something comes crashing down at some point. They go, I mean, oh, maybe. I, I, I think when I was in school, I was like, this is not fun anymore. Right. Like, I did this because I didn't want to have, like, a real job, and now yeah. this is turning into, like, hard work, and it's not fun anymore. So you just basically, on a whim, picked recording. Yeah. Because I, like, the, the, because I few... was like, someone surely must be in charge yeah, and just tell everybody recording. what to do. <laughs> yeah. uh, and I want that job. I have done about 70 of these, and there's uh, common themes come through because people from all walks of life. And one of them is weird stuff like, I just went and stood in that line and did that, and I'm yeah. really good at it. So that was, that was but you it. went you, you went to college in Massachusetts. So then I went to school in Boston yeah. for recording. And after about a year and a half, again, I would just excel at it, and I had already gotten a job before I graduated school. Right. But then started to go, why am I in Boston? This place yeah. sucks. I lived there myself. So I moved back to New York, and right. then life began for real. About 1999. That was, you moved into a recording studio as a sound engineer or something? Well, I moved to New York and was like applying for jobs, like a yeah. peon. Yeah. And ended up, my first job in a recording studio was at a place called Pyramid. It was on 5th Avenue and 32nd Street, right at the base of the Empire State Building. Right. And it was grim. Right. I got paid nothing. I worked really long hours. I recorded like You're awful runner, things, kind of. Yeah. Kind of. It yeah. was really grim. But then 9 11 happened and everything kind of changed. I started working in a different studio. And people always ask me, like, how did you become a producer? And I no, just really, yeah. literally just told people that I was a producer. That's it. You have to start just lying and be like, yeah, this is what I do. And then just kind of fake your way through it until you kind of. Like the, know the classic doing. image, and there's not much of it in here, is the old banks of things, right? You know, yeah. the, the, the different tracks and everything and how to track. Like, you presumably learned how to use those in college. So you were kind of able to work. The fundamentals, like, yeah, yeah. But that's not really what you're hired to do. Anybody no. can press a button. You're being hired for wisdom and. Yes. experience which i had none of yes but and i just kind of blagged my way through it yeah. yeah if you go back to your childhood you went into a room and picked up a drum kit you started picking up drumsticks and playing the drums and you have this something in you because you, you you said you excelled in a recording you have something in you that just hears something yeah. right that you can... a lot of record producers are drummers so there's like a rich right. history of drummers turned producer who were your kind of heroes, like Eno and all those guys, or did you have... Yeah, Brian Eno. There was a guy from here named Steve Lillywhite yeah. in the 90s that I was yeah. really into. I don't know. Again, like, I've never been somebody who... Copied or wanted to be like... Yeah, I never, like, would just say, I want to do that and learn everything about them. It would be more general, or I'd like, oh, I like that. I'm just going to find my own way. But, yeah, I probably should have, like, had, like, idols. Well, maybe <laughs> not. At least you can't be accused of plagiarism. Yeah, well. The, uh, the, while we're on the subject of Lily White, I was, I was, one of the things I was picked up on some of the interviews you've given, which a lot of them were very technical, and I sort of didn't understand a lot of the jargon. But you were talking about this overthinking things, and a lot mm. of your little flip notes, put a mic in front of the guitar and get them to play, and, like, you know, I probably, you know. And, and you, you too, at the moment, seem to be kind of caught in this kind of overthink. They're afraid almost to launch, yeah. and they're kind of getting new producers in, and they, they, they're they losing relevance by the year. You know, to what extent, when you look at a band like that, that seems a little bit frozen, how do you unlock it? Or is I mean, it possible? I... <laughs> You'd have to ask them because yeah. they won't hire me. If they option. hired me, yeah. I would try and probably fail at the first stage. Just be like, guys, what are you doing? What are we doing? Like, mm. you can do whatever you want, you know. And just, I think having a mega blunt conversation like that with yeah. them would be the best effort. But you know, like somebody like Bono is, he's probably just like lives in a different stratosphere, and yeah. he would just be like. Who is this peon talking to me? I think the tinker um, is the edge. I think he just keeps saying it's not fucking good enough. Not good yeah. Enough, and they keep putting it. Well, putting it it's not there. good enough. We're not in sitting in my studio right now, but if we were, yeah. you would be laughing because over my recording console, 
is a sign that I've had for a decade that I brought from New York that says don't overthink it. I, well, I mean, I'm, I'm ad based in as well. The advertising industry is famous for fucking taking hours and hours to decide whether it yeah. should be fruity or, or strawberry or something. Yeah. No, I hate that as well. Another thing I picked up when you were making, I think it was the first Harlem Shakes album or the first one you were with, and you, you played them Thriller before you yeah. did anything. What was the thinking behind that? Just trying to make like a cohesive, ambitious piece of work those yeah. guys are like real brainiacs real academics I saw them they all went in to New like, York when they were really young they yeah were, they, they all went to like you know Yale and mm. they're just really intelligent and I kind of wanted to somehow break them out of that but also like contextualize the idea of using that brain power to make something like ambitious and cohesive and yeah, yeah I don't know and fun it's fun really yeah People ask me all the time, like, are there any records that you made that, like, didn't do well that you really love? And they're, like, definitely one of them where we felt at the time we were making, like, a seminal Opus. album. Yeah. yeah, and it just wasn't received well by the press. But it's still so good when I listen back to it. It's, it's funny incredible. the same thing happens in my career. Where you, you, you do something that you think is going to be great, and it, 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 it just doesn't bite. And then something that you think is okay fucking bites and becomes mentally big and yeah i know it's my, i like it but i'm not sure it's my it's yeah. my achilles yeah no not achilles yeah i don't know it's it, that happens to everybody it's yeah i can't escape it what does the producer bring the you 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 have a very kind of brusque response to a lot of interviews about what you bring to the party and the, you know there's no big chase, but clearly they do bring something i mean clearly if you if you look at some of even Sorry for staying on you too, but some of the albums that have been produced by Lamar or Lily White or whatever, you can tell that they're they're starting. Do you, yeah. the difference between trying to reinvent a noise for a band and delivering the same kind of noise? Is that where you feel it? Yeah, I think that producers? like if you think about it, like uh, if you had to look at a table with dinner on it, I'm about yeah. to hit you with a famous Zane patented analogy. Uh, if you were looking at like a whole dinner table with a magnifying glass, you know, you kind of just highlighting little certain parts and choosing not to highlight the other parts. And I feel like that's kind of what we do is we try to draw your eyes and your ears to certain things and away from other things, yeah. you know. And for me, my kind of process is I can I, I kind of hear the song fairly complete in my head. And it's just a slow, arduous march to get Larry there, and, yeah. you know, whereas like the beginning of the song, the band might be overwhelmed and I can already hear it done. And it's my job to slowly march them down the field, yeah. you know, and then we get there and they're like, man, I never would have thought it would be like this. And, and you're you, like, I've been hearing it like this for days. Yeah. yeah. Those would be two ways that I would describe what our job is supposed to be in an abstract way. Just to go back to your timeline, you were in New York in this better job after 9-11. What sort of caused you then to leave New York? How long, how long did you spend in New York? At that? Well, New York from 2000 until 2006 was the music capital of the world, right? right. Like anybody brother who lived in Brooklyn and said he played guitar would get yeah. signed to a label. Yeah. Uh, so I was very lucky to be there in one of those seminal moments, just yeah. like there was in the 70s. And yeah. Then that ended. And then it took us about 10 years to let go of it. You know, so now we're about 2016. And, and we're talking about the collapse of the music industry, though. Specifically well. in New York. Yeah. And then just one day, it was like somebody flipped a switch and they all moved to LA. Really? Because New York just got too expensive and too boring and like yeah. there was no more bands there and there's no more bands anywhere so yeah. just i don't know if people started dripping away to la and then one day everybody just left them the labels left and the managers left and the yeah. bands left yeah. and everybody was just gone and i was just like left there paying this exorbitant rent on my studio exorbitant rent on my apartment hating la my wife works in fashion so she was chilling because right. new york's still really yeah. important for that and uh, but she's from here, and then I started working on her about moving here. My manager's also here, so okay. I've been managed by a woman from London for about five years. Right. It it was just a clear choice, and I've been spending so much time here. Right. I've been coming back and forth constantly for like the last two years. Yeah. I felt very comfortable here, 
So we just went for it. And what was the, did you feel that you were, the music scene has picked up better here than it, than in America? The, or? I can't say all about America, but yeah. I can say that like, yeah, New York, like New York was like a two out of 10 when I yeah. left and London's like an eight out of 10. And I just think the UK is just more progressive in general. So the music is more progressive. I think if you turn on Radio 1, most of the time, you're going to hear much cooler stuff than you would if you turned on whatever station in New York. I also think, as an outsider, I'm sure that you guys like won't admit it because it sounds a little cheesy, but I do think there's like a bit of the like Abbey Road, Beatles yeah. kind of legacy. And there's a pride, I find, that you guys take in recording music, live shows. You go to a live show in London and like... Most of the time, it's just generally going to be better than in New York. Yeah. It sounds a little better, looks a little better. There's just like a level of pride that doesn't exist yeah. in the States that I think subconsciously comes from your guys' like extremely rich yeah. history. And, and I think from, as an Irish guy, we have the same in, in Dublin as well. You know, yeah, well, I would lump you in. Yeah, yeah. The what, What's going to happen to the music industry? Paint me the picture for how you get out of the hole. Do you get out of the hole? Here's the thing. I don't know. Right. And no one knows. Yeah. Anybody that tells you that you is lying. You'd money if you did. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, it's just changing. But nope. it's a big impact on your job. Yeah, it already has. Yeah. Um, I always joke that, like, I was born in, like, the worst generation ever. Just after all the cool shit happened in the 80s. Yeah. And just before... <laughs> just before the new... Like, I feel like millennials have an advantage from us in that like they're just kind of like naive and like happy and like they're just yeah they, fed, whatever. yeah they yeah. just they're just loving it yeah but our generation kind of got to see the end of the old stuff to watch the birth of the internet yeah. and now where it's going so we're the ones that are caught in the like but even the concept of an album is done yeah you know see, we're like, just caught like in the middle of all that stuff but i don't know we're just gonna have to adapt i think hopefully it will be a combination of finding new things and new ways and maybe loosening up our grip a little bit on the absolute rape and pillage that takes place day to day from labels and Spotify. I was Gaga's documentary and she just got like that bit where the whole thing was out of the internet because some Belgian record shop fucking forgot to sell it and the day it was meant to be sold and suddenly it's just out and she's like, fuck it. No. Yeah. So I think she was with Ronson doing that. Doing that. Who, who, when you look at the future of all this stuff where you, you have to be big in order to get money from live performance and you get that back and like the, the guy who introduced me to you Gary Cohen is all about bringing brands and advertising in yeah. you know I hear some of the acts that are doing that and it's almost like the sellout thing you know it's like I mean the idea of commercial like getting to a point where we can the music business can start making lots and lots of money again do you think it'll ever come back? No no what are we selling? Well, you have art. to sell stuff to make money, yeah. but we don't sell anything. We yeah. just let you borrow it for nine ninety nine a month. Until you know, to it. But, but again, is, are you noticing that you're, you're doing more one off tracks rather than albums? Well, in this country, definitely. But a lot of that is by personal choice. I've kind of tried to shift musically what I'm doing a bit since I moved to the UK. In New York, I was definitely more of like a band guy. Mm -hmm. In London, I've been doing a lot more pop stuff, a lot more R&B stuff, and that typically lives in a more one-off songy world. Combined with the rise of Spotify at the same time, yeah. it's just it's just like, yeah, we're back to kind of the singles model. Make a song, put it out. If it does well, great. If it doesn't, go make another one and put it out and, and just kind of get on with it. Where do you sit on, just away from music, where do you sit on the state of, the world you look like a guy who probably right so the other out. the other thing i'd be remiss not to mention it wasn't just new york it wasn't just la and music it was dt it was dt i besides music my biggest kind of interest is politics i don't use the phrase i knew he was gonna win mm. i use the phrase i saw it coming it was like a tidal wave mm. and there was no way that we were gonna avoid it and it didn't matter if he won the damage is already going to be done when that wave crashed on the country. And I just had a kind of light bulb moment one day where I was like, I don't have to live here. <laughs> no, like, yeah, honestly, yeah. it was that simple. I remember it was like during the healthcare debate and the gay rights debate and all this shit where I was 
so humiliated to be in a place where <clears throat> we were wasting energy debating whether gay people should be allowed to get married. Chinese I was like, toilets what there. a stupid yeah. thing. And it just dawned on me. I was like, I don't have to be here. And it's terrifying, the idea of moving somewhere when you're almost 40 years old. But I kind of was into it. I thought it was like a really ballsy thing to do. All new friends, all new everything, yeah, you know? Yeah. And um, Actually, the politics here isn't that fucking great either. Right. So we get here about three weeks before Brexit. Yeah. <laughs> And I didn't know much about it. (laughs) I didn't know much about it. And then it happened. And I was like, and all my friends are texting me like, how does it feel to live in a nationalist country? And then, you know, cut to a few months later. And I'm very quick to tell people, listen, Brexit is a nightmare. Don't get me wrong. It's stupid. It is no way comparable to what is happening in America, which is going to, I think, affect the country for years. It's going to take years to scrub him away he could he could walk away today and that in the bar of general humanity has been lowered so low right. that it's just going to take a long time where people feel like it's not okay but there's an angry woke thing happening as well you know? but on both sides yeah well that's true that's true there's, there's and that's i think what's starting to come out more and more out with this well. whole russia yeah. thing which is yeah. to be honest like really Pretty genius on their part that yeah. they are now, it's being exposed that they would wind up all the people on the right against Muslims and, oh, yeah. I hate immigrants. Yeah. But then they would do the same thing to the people on the left yeah. and be like, I hate Trump supporters. Yeah. And they would get everybody all ready to kill each other. Equal and then they would war. just walk yeah. away. Yeah. 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 And that's still that's happening. very famous for doing that. Yeah. It's <laughs> still happening yeah. right now, today, where you still can go on Facebook and you see all these ropey websites that people post and you're like, what the hell is a law politics.com? You know, like that sounds suspicious. And it's just like a video of some Muslim woman in Britain going crazy, you know, and then there'll be a video on the other side of Bernie Sanders. And it's kind of sad that we've basically picked uneducated people and we have taken advantage of it and wound them all up. Same thing happened here, right? Well, but, I mean, there, you know, I mean, Macron is, is, is struggling at the moment, but, you know, he broke down 30 years' worth of two-party system in, in France, like, overnight. I don't know how yeah. he did it, but it, it can change. I mean, like, I'm, I think it's deeply disturbing. I was the same as you. I spent seven years in America, and I'm like, how have I just spent seven years here? I didn't even intend on coming for three. Yeah. And, you know, I'm very, very happy to get out. Last question before I let you go. What would you say to the young kid who was uh, creeping into his brother's drunk kid all those years ago if you had to go back? One thing, which they're not going to want to hear, is think about how much you like music. Because if you really love it, if you really love it, you might not want to do this. Because I don't listen to music anymore. If you really love it, you might Yeah, because I don't listen to music anymore. I hate music. It's a busman's holiday. I go home and I'm like, please... Nothing. I want silence. I want to like sit with a dog and like watch like Celebrity Big Brother. I can't listen to any music. But I would just no. I would just say do it. It's not as glamorous as it appears, and you should. I think to work in any creative field, yeah. be prepared for the crawl and the yeah. climb. Your day to day when you wake up and you're like, fuck oh, man, thank God I don't have to go sit in a cubicle today. That pretty much makes it worth it. And that never goes away. Every day I'm just walk down the street and look at some guy working in the three shop and be like, Ooh, well, at least you're not doing thank that. God I'm not doing that. I'm very lucky. So I, I, it's in the front of my mind every day how lucky I am. I never think of it as like, Ugh, you know, and that's yeah. why when people take Monday off and Friday off and, oh, I got to go to Glastonbury and I better take the week before Glastonbury off. I'm like, dude, we have the best job in the world. Like, yeah. stop fucking about. Come on. Go to work. Do something. You know, you come in late, you leave early and you go out to a pub all night. Like, that's not hard. So, stop complaining like it's so difficult. Chris saying thank you for coming on a pint with Sean and giving me your time. and was valuable. You're very welcome. Cheers, buddy.